Good morning and God bless you all on this lovely spring day. I hope everyone is doing well out there in the world. Was anybody a little warm last night? I, did, I, was, I was not ready for it, for sure. So, um, But it's beautiful and I will appreciate that. Thanks be to God. Um, this morning we're doing things a little different, obviously. You may have noticed this is a hymn sing Sunday. That means we're going to be picking the hymns. Um, I think we're going to pick them as we get to them this morning. So if you've got a favorite in mind, um, wonderful. If you haven't yet had time to find your favorites, uh, you'll have a little bit of time during the service. But please know flipping through pages, at least during my sermon or communion in particular. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave that to your discretion, though. We do need our gathering song. Any requests? Oh, we got all sorts of hands. So we got, um, all right, in the back. I think I saw Heather's hand first. So, which is what? 660? Oh, I love to tell the story. 661. All right. Now, five people have gotten their favorite done. So we... 661. You'll find them in your red hymnals in the pews in front of you. I know we haven't used these much in a while. So if you've forgotten, it's just a book. All right. I love to tell the story. Let's please rise and sing it together. be seated. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, 
We long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. Amen. We come now to our Kyrie. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Now together let us profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now I would like to invite our choir to come up and sing for us.
Thank you for that offering of music. Uh, I'd like to invite you to please rise, because I'm going to make you move around. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's share that peace with one another. Thank you. All right, just a couple of announcements this morning. Nothing major, easy to remember and all that. Um, just the first thing is no class after service today, for the, no adult forum for after service today or for the next couple of weeks until the Sunday after Mother's Day. I, I'm assuming everybody has plans on Mother's Day. Um, so we're not going to have class that Sunday. And then we'll pick back up with our History of Theology c classes after that. Let's see. Also, um, just uh, draw your attention to the, to the uh, upcoming events on the back page of your bulletin. Uh, we've got the, the Dirt Dabblers are having their sale here on May 6th. I've had a few people asking about that. And yes, it's happening. The thing I've been told is get there early because things run out. Is that fair to say? All right. So if you like plants or you want to... I don't know, just support the Dirt Dabblers. Show up. That'll be great. All right, that's all my announcements, unless there's anything from the congregation that I need to know or have missed since I've been gone this last week. Okay. Then let's, let's uh, you say where you are, but let's all pray together. Our hymn, our prayer of the day, excuse me. Let us pray. O oh God, our shepherd, you know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice, that we may walk in certainty and security to the joyous feast prepared in your house. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our service continues with our first reading. Thank you, Norman. I'm reading from my uh, children's Bible today, uh, verse 42 to 47 in Acts chapter 2. It says, the believers studied what the apostles taught. They shared life together, 
They broke bread and ate together, and they prayed. Everyone felt that God was near. The apostles did many wonders and miraculous signs. All the believers were together. They showered everything they had. They sold, they sold what they owned. They gave each other everything they needed. Every day they met together in the temple courtyards. In their homes they broke bread and ate together. Their hearts were glad and honest and true. They praised God. They were respected by all the people. Every day the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Amen. The word of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Christ. Could I have the children please come up? Come on up, you guys. You're all right. Pretty sure. Good morning. Good morning. How, how's everybody doing? So you guys heard our first lesson that Norman read so nicely. Um, what do you think about that? About everybody sharing everything in common about the, the, dis, the disciples and the apostles. They were growing the number. People were becoming Christians. It's a fun story, the book of Acts. A lot of wonderful things are happening. But what does that mean to share and to have generous hearts? What does it mean? That's right, to, give, to make sure everybody has everything they need. Does that make sense? Like, what, what's, what's stuff that people need? What do you got? Food, Food right. Water. Water. What do you think? Stuffies? You know what? I think some people might need those. That's fair. What else? Anything else? A house, a place to stay, right? This, this is stuff people need. And they would, they would have people sell all their possessions and, and buy all the things that they needed and they were sharing. But that's, that's hard. What, what do you got? Stores? I don't think you can buy a store, but you need a store to get stuff out, right? I, so, I, I see what you're saying. Hold that thought. Because it's, it's, a, it's challenging to share everything and to, and to live that way. And in fact, we find out that in the book of Acts, it didn't, it didn't last too long, unfortunately. They did it for a long time and they tried to share, but people started to take advantage. They took more than they needed. They, they asked for things they didn't have and they kept back possessions and didn't share them with people because they thought, oh, maybe I won't have enough if I give it all away. And they started to get scared, right? They started to not share in the same way and it stopped working that way after a while. Yeah, some people got greedy. That's very true. And that's, that's a hard thing. The challenge, of course, is in any community is to have good judgment about how to share and how to take care of each other. We do our best. We try. The church has its food pantry, and we, we share. We, we bring up the offering, and we distribute it in ways that serve the community as best we can. But it can be hard to decide. How do you, how do you have good judgment? What do you think? Do you know what I mean when I say good judgment about sharing and taking care of people? Well, no, not, not doing it. It's more like, how do we decide the best way to help? I think that's a good way to talk about it. What do you, th- what do you think a good, a good way, like if you want to help somebody, how do you think about it? Or maybe you don't. What do you think? Give them blankies. I think you are a lover of comfort. I've decided this. I get it. And that's not a bad thing. What, do you, what else you got? But how do you decide who gets it and who doesn't if you don't have enough for everybody, right? I'm, yeah, we want to take care of everybody who doesn't have enough, those things we talked about. But sometimes you don't have enough to share with everybody. Sometimes some people don't treat the things you offer them very well, and so you do your best to figure that out. And honestly, there's no magic formula, right? We, we talk about the golden rule, which is what? Do you guys remember? What did, what did Jesus teach us? What do you think? What do you got? What do you think? Well, that's, he certainly said that, always be kind to your neighbors, but I'm thinking of do unto others as they would, you would have them do unto you, right? So treat people the way you would like to be treated. Does that make sense? So how do you like being treated? I'm thinking stuffies and blankies and pillows. You like, you like being comfortable and warm? All right, so if somebody else is not comfortable and warm, that's probably going to be a priority for you. That's not a bad thing. That's good to share, make sure people feel safe, right? But 
we, have to, we, we simply have to do our best because it can be very challenging. Some people don't appreciate the gifts we give. Some people take advantage of us when we offer them help. But it doesn't mean we stop helping. We do our best to, to, to speak to them, to build a relationship with them, and to say, how can we help you in a way that's meaningful, that's more than just one meal for today, but that will put them in a better situation for their whole life, right? It's a hard thing to do, but it's a job that I do and other pe- a lot of people in this congregation help make happen. You got a question about that? No, I was going to ask how you get jobs. Well, we, would, we do try and get people jobs. And actually, uh, I do. <laughs> I may, people might not know that I try and help people find jobs uh, as often as I can because it comes up. And so if you know of people who need employees, I'm talking to the whole congregation, if there are job openings out there, let me know because people ask me that kind of stuff more often than you might think. Do you, do you know of somebody who needs a job? Maybe. Give them a chance, right? What do you think? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So is this, she's getting a new job, is that what, what made you think of that? <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna end up with a, with a prayer this morning, okay? That's interesting. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you continue to give us the patience and the, the ability to make good, good judgment around people's needs. Help us to help all the people we can and help that help to be as effective as it can be for, for them to build strong and healthy lives. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming up. I appreciate it. I'd like to invite you now to please rise for the gospel acclamation. gospel according to John. Glory Glory to to you, O Lord. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So... Jesus here is talking about several things, but I I suppose we should put in mind the the false messiahs that had come before. Jesus is the gate, right? The the way by which people find salvation. And those others that claim such things prior to him were thieves and bandits. That seems to be what he's implying. Uh, We could extrapolate further and say he was also talking about the scribes and the Pharisees with their false teachings from time to time, their there are ways of misguiding people and taking advantage of people. Um, that can get a little dangerous, though, so I don't know if I want to go that far, but it is worth thinking about. Jesus is speaking very metaphorically, but very strongly. I am the gate, he says. It, had me, it really got me thinking about this, and, and honestly, I wrote this a couple of weeks ago because I was gone this last week, so I'm going to stick to my notes a little bit more. I didn't have as much time to to prepare as I normally do, but it made me think about a lot of discussions that are going on around Christianity today. 
Maybe you've seen some of the articles that have been coming out. I noticed a, a few weeks ago, especially, there were several articles on about Christianity and its future, right? These were articles written by relig some religious figures, but more oftentimes they were um, by sociologists or um, just pe commentators on society, right? Not necessarily people who were participated in the faith. And interestingly, they basically said, I wouldn't count Christianity out, right? There's been a lot of talk, as, you know, is this the end of Christianity, is the church is in decline, things are falling apart, it's all going to be over soon. But that's not what they said, and I found that interesting. And one of, the, one of the interesting notes that one of the commentators said was, well, if we look back in history, and we see other periods where church participation was a little bit low, and people started to say, is this the end? And then there was a big revival, and Christianity was bigger and stronger than ever. Right? And that happened at least twice within American history. This is not the first time we've had declines, and so don't see a decline as an end. It's important to remember. Because even in Jesus' day, a lot of people saw Israel and certainly the temple in decline. These ideas are, are not unique to Christianity or to our faith or to any faith in particular. There are periods of ups and downs of strength and of weakness, and certainly we're not as robust as we used to be. But that doesn't mean that things are falling apart, and we might be surprised once again. I don't know if we'll have a, a third great awakening, as it has been called in the past. Who knows what will happen in the future? I don't get into that game because it is a losing game, but it's interesting to think about. A lot of this discussion about the future of Christianity, of course, comes about because of some of these declines, but also because of the challenges ahead of us as Christians in this nation, as certainly as Lutherans more specifically, but Christians in general, right? There are challenges that we see. Some of it is the state of theology is not great. There's a lot of bad theology and bad ideas out there. Uh, I would call it misinformation and even disinformation. If you spend any time online or any social media, you see a lot of kooky things about faith, about Christianity, about Jesus, about scripture. There's a lot of weird and poorly informed ideas out there. Um, I, do, I guess I would say maybe skip that if you can. Try and stay off of the social media because it seems to be mostly people getting weirder ideas rather than finding deeper truths. Not exclusively, but that seems to be much more common. Maybe that's my own bias because I try to stay off of social media, but I have to poke my head in every now and again because people ask me questions, right? I try to be informed. But the, the big thing that's got people scared, I think, is really Christian nationalism, right? I've talked about that before. We see it out there. We see it as, an, as a pretty signif significant force, maybe more so within politics than within Christianity more Christianity proper, if you want to call it that, right? But it's out there, and it's got people scared. And I've said in the past, and I'll say again, Christian nationalism is a weird idea. Jesus, of course, founded no nation and quite intentionally founded no nation, right? People expected the Messiah to be a great political leader, and Jesus said no thanks. And so the idea that we would start a Christian nation now seems quite backwards and counter to what Christ did in this world, and yet people are trying to do that. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have Christian ideals in the way that we organize society and culture, but to have a Christian nation doesn't make sense, according to what Jesus himself tried to do while he was on earth, because Christianity should be beyond nations, right? If we give it a border, we give it limits, and Christ observed no limits, and we shouldn't impose any upon him either. By becoming a Christian nation, we're saying, we're the real Christians and nobody else can be as good as us, which is, of course, what will happen. It's what's happened in the past when people have tried this nonsense. I don't want to limit Christ. And I hope we can remember that because we get weird ideas. And again, this comes back to the state of theology, right? We think that to be a Christian means to be perfect and pure and the best and having everything right and being better than everybody else. And that's terrible theology and has nothing to do with the cross. But it's an idea that's out there and it's got me a little bit nervous, right? It's got me a little bit uncomfortable because I'm never going to live up to that. I certainly don't now and I have a hard time imagining it in the future. I'm much more interested in a Christianity that focuses on God's grace and forgiveness and the hope of renewal. 
rather than strictures and guidelines and rules and laws and being perfect. I've never known anybody perfect. If you've met them, introduce me. It'd be interesting. (laughs) This Sunday's text is interesting to me. It hit me hard around these ideas because Jesus is saying, I am the gate, right? I'm the way. You've got to come to me. Look to me to find answers, to find truth, to find hope and a future. And I think we don't do that very often. Now, now let me explain, right? Of course, we turn to Jesus. Our faith relies on Christ. We see our salvation found in Christ. But we don't often look at the example Christ gave us as our roadmap, right? Maybe you do in your lives. Maybe you say, maybe you still ask that old kind of cliche saying, what would Jesus do? Do people remember that from the 90s? It was popular for a while. I think it's kind of what got, a, got the silly wristbands going. I shouldn't say silly. Maybe you love them. It's fine. I don't have a problem. <laughs> but what would Jesus do was a popular refrain, but people don't ask that question anymore. And I think some of that is because, well, it doesn't fit in with nationalistic ideas about Christianity, right? What would Jesus do? Well, he wouldn't be a nationalist. What would Jesus do? Well, he wouldn't call other people terrible, right? What would Jesus do? Well, he wouldn't condemn people to hell. He'd offer them a hand and show them love, right? I think that's one of the reasons why people don't ask that question anymore, because it doesn't mesh up well with some of the ideas that we see in our culture more broadly. Jesus wouldn't do those things, and it's very obvious once you start asking those questions, right? Everybody with me? Because what was Jesus interested in when he was here on earth? And I'm asking this as a very literal question. You know, over the pandemic, I kind of got out of the habit of bugging you guys by asking you questions. I want to hear from you. I want to get back into that habit because I get bored of hearing my own voice, if you can believe it, right? So what were some of the things, some of the ideals that you saw Jesus living into in Scripture, right? Just name it. Yell it out. It's fine. Love. Simple. What else? Kindness, absolutely. Anything else? Salvation. Salvation. Happiness? Sure. Charity. Forgiveness. Forgiveness. You know what I didn't hear in that beautiful cacophony? Judgment, condemnation, and violence. Amen. Jesus wasn't about those things. And people that claim them are the thieves and bandits that Jesus is discussing in our text today. They are misusing the name of Christ for their own agenda, and it's not a new game. It's not a new idea. It's not something people haven't tried in the past. It's happened all the time. Jesus himself had to confront it because he saw people using his faith, the Jewish faith at that time, for things that it was not intended for, right? Mostly it comes down to accumulating accumulating power and wealth for themselves and excluding people that didn't agree with them, right? Nothing new. Not a new game was new, was all the things we mentioned, that compassion, that forgiveness, that love that did not see borders or allegiances. It saw beyond all those things and brought us all together. That was the hope. That was always the hope in Judaism and continues to be the hope in Judaism and Christianity today. It's what Jesus wanted. It's what Jesus would do, did do, is calling us to do today. That is why he continues to be our gate, our path, our salvation. Lutherans have a, a phrase, I guess, sort of a motto, right? How do we, how do we decide how to move forward as a church? How do we, what's, our, what's our guideline, right? What's our, what's our guiding light? And we talk about scripture as our source and norm, which is a very vague phrase, right? Our source and norm. That doesn't really say that much, but it just means... Whenever we are talking about things as a denomination, as a people, as a church more broadly, we're going to refer back to Scripture and say, is this where they were going? Is this the way that God instructed God's people to move? Is this how Jesus, especially Jesus, acted in the world? Because we read all of Scripture through the lens of Christ. What would Jesus do? Right? He would offer love and hope Forgiveness and renewal to all people, not just the ones we like best. That's why he continues to be our gates. And I hesitate. I, 
I tend to default toward forgiveness, default toward acceptance, default toward letting everybody in. Some people, they take advantage. They abuse. They misuse. And, and sometimes we got to say, no, thank you. You have misunderstood what we're about, and you're doing things that are hurting the community. I don't like to do that. That makes me uncomfortable to say, you got to figure this out before you can be a part of this, right? Sometimes that's what we have to do. We have to say no to bad ideas. We have to say no to manipulation and abuse. We have to say no to people who are seeking power and personal gain rather than compassion and love for their neighbors. I don't like saying no. I like saying yes much better. But in this day and age, I think we have to say no. We have to say no to those people who, who don't ask what Jesus would do, right? Jesus has to continue to be our cornerstone, our rock, the foundation upon which we make all of our decisions, and the, and the guidepost by which we judge the decisions of others. When we see people claiming Christ as their Lord and Savior, but not acting as Christ would do in the world, we have to say no to them. We have to call out the banditry, call out the abuses, and say this is not what God intended. And it's pretty obvious if we just ask a few simple questions, right? But for some reason, we don't see people asking those questions. That's what's got me worried, right? That's what's got me frustrated. And sometimes downright irate, right? We certainly don't see that in our media and in our popular culture. We see Christians as the bad guys rather than the ones who follow Christ. Some of them deserve that moniker, bad guys, but we know that most do not. And I think the only way we can resuscitate that image is by saying no to those people who are trying to sneak over the gate and are abusing Christ's love and compassion. Remember, simple, it's simple. Just ask, is this something Christ would do? Can I imagine Christ doing this? Speaking this way about other people? Shutting the door on these people or that people? Can I imagine the Christ I know from scriptures, our source and norm, offering hate to anyone or advocating violence against others? I have a hard time. I think you do too. Amen. All right, let's, oh, we get to pick another hymn. Feels like a while. Oh, all right, Rebecca, you, got, you were fast. I don't know if it's about speed. I just saw her first. So what do you got? 511, thy strong word. All right, pull out your red hymnals and please rise as you're able. Let's sing together thy strong word. Oh, I should, I should qualify this slightly. Our musicians have to be able to play the hymns, right? So if, if they can't, um, try another one, I guess, right? Are we okay with this one? Okay, that's fair, that's fair. I should say thank you to, uh, to Sue and to Mary for jumping in and being able to just play on the fly. I appreciate it very much. All right, let's sing together. Thy strong word, 511.
Let's continue now with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You are the shepherd who gathers us in your mighty and loving arms. Help your church listen to your voice, especially when the voices of sin, idolatry, and oppression threaten to overpower us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. The green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys of this earth are all belong to you, O Lord. Sustain your creation with a love that is both mighty and just. Where there is destruction, bring healing. Where there is desolation, bring abundance. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You proclaim shepherding love, comfort, and protection for all the people and all of creation. Direct leaders in our time to learn from your example and instruction. Give them servant hearts that they generously seek the good of all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You journey with us wherever our paths may lead. We pray for those feeling overwhelmed by anxiety or depression or suffering in any way. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You are the sheep gate that gives safety to your beloved flock. Provide protection for refugees, victims of domestic violence, those who are imprisoned, and all people who are vulnerable to violence and mistreatment. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. For whom else do the people of God pray? Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call your sheep by name and lead them through the valley of death. We give you thanks for those who have died and now dwell in your house forever. Be with those who mourn and give them hope in the promise of resurrection. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. All right, we need an offering hymn. Does anybody have a hymn they want that would, would do well for an offering? Vicki, in the back? 779, what's the name of that one? Oh, Amazing Grace. How do you go wrong with that, right? All right, Amazing Grace, 779. Let's please rise as you're able.
Let us pray. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his humble way of service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for your promise and presence which have sustained the faithful in this and every generation. Above all, we give you thanks for Jesus, born of Mary, who in word and deed announced your gentle rule of justice, reconciliation, and peace. On the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As we continue to ask what Jesus would do, let us start by praying in the way that he taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Uh Uh-oh. I'm getting a note. I love it. I feel important. Oh, I I knew that, but thank you. (laughs) Oh, I, okay, we need two communion hymns before we move any farther. Sorry, time out, pause, pause all my wonderful helpers. So uh, I'm looking for, um, can, can you write them down? Because I'm, I'm doing other things, thank you. Uh, so we need to pick two. Do we have a, a suggestion for a good communion hymn? It doesn't have to be specifically a communion hymn. Somebody, I see Amos in the back. 290, what's the, what's the name of that one? Go tell it on the mountain. All right. Not traditionally for communion, but I like it. It's Gayla's birthday. She gets to pick the next one. Oh. Lift high the cross. What number is that? What number is that? Oh. No, no. That's fine. Well, I... I, uh, Sue wants to do it for the the sending. Is that okay if we do that then? All right. Because, I mean, we'll all start marching as we're taking communion, which would be fun, but... All right, well, we need one more, that means. Dina. Oh, this is my father's world. All right. What number is that? 824. All right. Um, so first one is 290, go tell it on the mountain, but not and, quite yet. And Cheryl, you'll call them out when we get to them? Yes. Thank you. All right, now, if I could please have my helpers come forward. Um, 
Here at Peace Lutheran Church, all people, of course, are welcome at the Lord's table. So once it is prepared, I will invite you to come forward. Thank you. First communion hymn is number 290, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We have number 824, This Is My Father's World.
Let us pray. Gracious God, in you we live and move and have our being. With your word and this meal of grace, you have nourished our life together. Strengthen us to show your love and serve it and serve the world in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you now to uh, please rise for the blessing and dismissal and, of course, our sending song. Which is Lift High the Cross, number 660. So I'll bless once. It looks like everybody has that ready. 660, Lift High the Cross. Okay. The God of all who raised Jesus from the grave bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Let's sing together, Lift High the Cross. If you didn't get a chance to hear your favorite hymns, you can always email us. We're happy to listen to your suggestions. But for now, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.